This is a plain green pill with a special edition of the Blaine Swallow Show. We call it an on-the-road ver version of Blaine Swallow Show. And we're here on the, at the Asheville Radium Museum on the campus of AB Tech. And what you see is kind of me coming into the museum and I'm going to be walking and talking at the same time. Hopefully I can do both those things. And with me today as our special guest is Stuart Smolkin. And Stuart, you can say hello to all your fans and friends on Facebook Live. Hi, Blaine. Nice to have you here today. Okay, and Stuart is going to be giving us a tour of the Asheville Reading Museum. And Stuart, we're really excited to be here. So I'm going to turn it over to you. And why don't you take from the top, when we come in, we, we see what we see, and, and you greet us. Is that correct? It, it is. And just to kind of orient you, Blaine, to the museum, what you're seeing at the wall you're looking at right now is primarily amateur radio equipment. There's something like 800,000 amateur radio operators in the United States, and I think 20,000 of them are in North Carolina. On the wall behind you is more home radio equipment, starting at the very early days of radio and moving forward to today. So what I'll do is try and show your audience some of the more interesting things that are in the museum, and hopefully one day they'll have a chance to visit. And so let me ask you, before we begin the tour then, how did you get interested in this whole topic? Well, for me, it started when I was a teenager, Blaine. Uh, when you're in the Boy Scouts, you can earn a merit badge for doing different things. And so I decided to earn a merit badge in radio. And an amateur radio operator in our neighborhood took me and a few other boys under his wings and taught us how to become amateur radio operators. And that led to a hobby with electronics. And here I am today now as the curator of this museum. And in another life, before you became the curator of the museum, were you in electronics? I was not. It was always just a hobby. Uh, so I, I kind of self-taught and just learned everything along the way. And how did you become involved in the Asheville Radio Museum? had a radio that I wanted to get repaired that I, I bought when I moved up to Asheville. I'm originally from New Orleans. And people pointed me towards the Asheville Radio Museum, which I'd never heard of. But in any event, I made contact with them, and they were very helpful for me in, in getting my radio restored. And so you restored the radio? They helped me restore the radio, and I decided to become a volunteer and was very excited to be, become the curator of the museum. Now, is the radio actually part of this museum? Or you it, have it, at home? it is not. I have it at home so I can enjoy it. Okay, super. Anyway, so it, that let's say that we want to come to visit. Yes. And I think we're telling you off the air that the radio museum is best to see on what day is? We are open on Saturdays from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And we have very detailed directions on our website, which is www.avlradiomuseum.org. Uh, there's free parking available just, just right next, adjacent to the museum, actually. We're in the Elm Building, and we're in room 315 of the Elm Building on the third floor. And this is on the AB Tech campus. It's on the, it's on the AB Tech campus. Right, the main drag is what road was it? Well, uh, the main drag coming through the campus is Victoria right. Road. And the parking garage is just off of uh, Fern Ferniehurst, which is at the intersection of Victoria Road and Ferniehurst. There's a conference center building about a block ahead, and the parking garage is, is uh, behind the, the conference center. And we have highly detailed directions to find the museum on our website with step-by-step -step for getting from the parking garage to our, our, uh, our facility here. And if I can find it, anybody can. Well, <laughs> well said. And the other thing, uh, Stuart, you mentioned to me, too, that even though you're open Saturdays 1 to 3, you're also available if groups want to come in or specialized tours, they can be arranged as well? That's, that's exactly right. We've, we do uh, tours for classes. We've done music classes, history classes, science classes. Uh, we go out and participate in, in school STEM nights. Uh, Women's History Museum, or History Club rather, has, has been here. We have church groups that come through. And in particular, if there are, are tourists in town that cannot come during our regular open hours on Saturday, or if there are families here that have visitors coming into town that want to see the museum, they can use the contact form on our website uh, to send an email to me, and we can usually accommodate them at some other time. Great. And let's now talk a little bit about some of the things that you'll actually see. So rather than just, um, I guess, describing the museum, why don't we actually show it to folks? So I, I, I will. I want to say a few words about radio before we get into that. Sure. Because I want your audience to understand how amazing radio waves are. If you think about a sound wave, a sound wave travels at just one-fifth of a mile per second, but a radio wave travels at 186,000 miles per second. 
So if we were to aim a radio wave at the moon, it would get there in just under two seconds. Uh, another thing that's so fascinating about radio waves is that they don't require uh, air or water to go through. In other words, a sound wave, you need to have air or water for it to, to travel. But a radio wave can travel through the vacuum of space, which is something a sound wave cannot do. But in addition to that, radio waves are self-perpetuating. And what that means is they can go on through the vacuum of space for billions and billions of miles because uh, there's just nothing in space that would absorb their energy except a little bit of dust here and there. But a radio wave actually consists on two, of two separate waves. There's an electric wave and a magnetic wave together. And as part of the electric wave dies out, it generates the next part of the magnetic wave. And as part of that dies out, it generates the next part of the radio wave, so uh, of the electrical wave, rather. So unlike a sound wave, a radio wave is self-perpetuating and can go on forever. So to me, that's fascinating. But the other thing that I think your visitors would enjoy understanding is that radio is so important to so many of the things we use in our daily lives today. We just don't think about it. So for example, if you have a cell phone, that's a radio. If you use GPS, that's a radio. If you have a Bluetooth speaker, that also is a radio. If you have wireless internet router at home, that is a radio. If you fly on planes and you depend on radio, radar to keep us safe, that's radio. In the early days when television came out, television is actually radio. A television set would actually have a receiver for the audio and a receiver for the video signal and put them together for you to watch. So the thing is, radio is not only very fascinating, it is so very important to so many things we take for granted today. Okay, so now that we have background, Stuart, let's now see some of the things that folks will come in and see when they visit you. Okay, we'll, we'll do that, Blaine, and when I give a tour to folks that come in, it normally could take anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half just because people find that many things that are interesting to them, but what we'll try and do is just hit some of the highlights in the museum that there are things that people uh, would enjoy seeing. Uh, one of the things that always attracts attention is this early Morse code practice machine. When radio first got started, it was not possible to send uh, sound or music. You could only send what's called Morse code, which is a series of dots and dashes that represent letters and numbers. And so in order for a person to use Morse code, they have to learn what the dots and dashes are and how they translate into these letters and numbers. Now, do people still learn Morse code? In fact, they do. <laughs> a lot of people still find it enjoyable. Yes, I remember when I was in Cub Scouts, I think I had to learn Morse code. Was that it? More than likely. And in particular, if you were trying for a radio merit badge or uh, to get your amateur radio license, back then you had to know at least a little bit of Morse code. Today it's possible to become an amateur radio operator without knowing Morse code at all. But you still know Morse code? <laughs> it's been a long time, Blaine. Let's see what Morse code sounds like. We'll turn on this machine. This is a hundred-year-old machine. It winds up like a clock. And when I turn on the start, so that's very fast Morse code. I'll slow it down. So a person would start out at a slow speed, and then as they become more familiar with uh, Morse code, they would move to a higher speed. But this is the machine that people find so interesting because it's 100 years old and it's capable of doing these things. And it still works? It, it works just fine. The Morse code itself is on these wheels that are turning around, and little bumps on the wheels are the dots and the dashes. And you notice that, that this is a stack here, and so it's possible to change the order of the wheels. So if somebody were taking a test and the instructor thought they might be cheating by memorizing a wheel, they just changed the order of the wheels and you couldn't cheat. It's like the eye vision test. <laughs> I always wonder about that. They, they that's, that's, it right. on you. that's right. You can't memorize the chart. Great. So anyway, that's, that's, that's early radio. That's Morse code, and that's how you practice. But let's come over here and see how radio waves were actually sent. Blaine, in, in the early days, you could not send voice or music on a radio. All you could do is create pulses of radio waves. So a short pulse would be a dot, and a long pulse would be a dash. And the way that was done was with a transmitter that looks something like this. There is a Morse code key on the side, which I can tap to send a message. 
But look closely here, Blaine, if you can pick it up on your camera, and you'll see sparks. So as I tap out the key, what I'm doing is, is generating sparks right here. And so the spark is actually creating a radio wave. If I hold up my friend Mickey Mouse here, This, this was in the late 1800s, and so in the late 1800s, you'd use this to, to actually send a radio signal. So the radio signals were predicted by a mathematician whose name was James Maxwell. He's, he's from the United Kingdom, and he theorized the existence of these waves, although they were not called radio waves at the time. But about 20 years later, there was a German scientist whose name was Heinrich Hertz, and Hertz decided to see if he could prove radio waves existed. So he created an apparatus in his laboratory. This part would create sparks, so he'd have an assistant create sparks. And he would walk around his laboratory with a loop of wire that looks like this. And the loop of wire has a tiny gap at the top. So when his assistant created a big spark with that apparatus, if he were in the right place and this gap were the right size, he'd see a tiny spark here. and that. That, would, that was what he determined to be a radio wave. He thought of what are all the other possibilities that could explain the spark, and he said the only thing that this could be is this wave that the mathematician Maxwell theorized. So that's how radio waves were actually proven to exist. And so when we talk about the frequency of a radio station today, we call it megahertz or kilohertz. Well, the hertz part is because of Heinrich Hertz's last name. It was named in honor of him. And before that, people didn't believe it, or what, what was the thinking? Well, <laughs> people, you, you can't see a radio wave, you can't hear a radio wave. We have eyes that can see light, and we have ears that can hear sound, but we have nothing in our body that can actually sense a radio wave. So people just didn't give it any thought because they had no idea that, that it existed. But once it existed, there was still the question of how do you make it useful? So there's about 20 years after Hertz conducted his experiments, <clears throat> there was a young man in Italy uh, named Guglielmo Marconi, and Marconi was able to uh, get a copy of the plans for building a receiver and transmitter, and he started doing experiments on his own. What he realized was that, that the radio wave could go much further than Heinrich Hertz thought it could. Uh, his thinking was that it could only be done in a, in a laboratory and wasn't very interesting or useful. Marconi discovered that he could actually send a radio signal for 100 yards or more. So eventually, <coughs> He was able to prove that you could send a radio wave across the entire Atlantic Ocean, and once that was done, people began to realize that radio could, in fact, be useful. So the apparatus that he used as a receiver, this is a modern replica of that, but it's actually a working replica. Uh, we can't do it in the museum because of the interference from the fluorescent lights. But this little tube here is what actually detects the radio signal. So if a radio signal comes from the antenna, <coughs> It goes through here. There's very, very tiny particles between these two electrodes, and the radio signal causes those particles to clump together. And when that happens, it causes this bell to ring. So a short ring would be a dot, and a long ring would be a Morse code dash. And so that's what Marconi actually used. Of course, he didn't have these little modern batteries and so forth, but this is essentially what his apparatus looked like. And that was when in the early 1900s. This was early 1900s. He act Marconi actually proved that you could send a radio signal across the Atlantic in 1902. And so that's, that's when that started. Uh, something that your viewers might find interesting is the Titanic. When in 1912, there was a law passed that said big passenger liners had to have a radio room, which was not required until then. So the Titanic launched in 1912 and it had a radio room. And because it did, they were able to get uh, Morse code distress, distress calls before the ship went down. And so the thinking is that those signals actually help get the rescue boats there quicker to save the people in the lifeboats before they froze to death. Was that the first time that it had it ever been in a big ship like that? Um, one of the first times? Well, in 1912. Whatever ships right. were coming out in 1912 would have had the radio room. Let's, let's just look at a few other interesting things without going in any particular order, but just things I think your viewers would find fascinating. Sure. This, this here, Believe it or not, is the first 
remote control that was intended for home use. Uh, we all think of the little controls that we use today uh, for TVs as, as being what a remote control looks like. But, but in 1930s, in the late 1930s, a company called Philco came out with this and they called it the mystery remote. So the reason they called it a mystery remote is there's no wires. It would connect to a large console radio, but you could carry this around your house and you could change the volume or change the stations on your large console radio. And because there's no wires, it's, a, it's called a mystery remote. But the secret is that this is actually has a little transmitter built into it. And so it sends a signal to your big radio console that causes the, something inside the console to change the station or to change the, the volume. And what's very good about that, you also got your exercise just carrying it around. Well, you would. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty heavy. Very but, cool. but, but notice it's made out of a beautiful wooden cabinet. And that's because in the early days, radios were actually very expensive. Not everybody could afford one. And so you wanted to have it in your house where you could display it and it would look like a nice attractive piece of furniture. So if you're able to pan your camera upwards a little bit, you'll see some of the, the beautiful wooden radios and beautiful speakers uh, that, that came out during the early days of radio. <coughs> so this particular radio, because it's shaped like this, is called a cathedral radio. And this radio like this, because of its shape, is called a tombstone radio. And then if you're able to pan your camera around to this one on the table here with the lid on it that goes down, this was referred to as a coffin radio. So anyway, these are early styles of radio, and as, as mentioned, they, they were designed to be in beautiful cabinets. I imagine the remote probably wasn't too popular that, you know, uh, people weren't buying those like they use remotes nowadays. Well, these big console radios at the time were, were very expensive. There's, there's one that's not really in your camera range right now, but it's made in 1929, and, and it would cost thousands of dollars in today's money. Uh, it, was, it was over it was several hundred dollars back, back then. But a wealthy person could have this. Did you notice the, the dial on here? The, the dial is designed to look like a telephone because the telephone came out in the, around 1875, if I remember right, and it had a dial. So when Philco <coughs> decided what does the user interface need to be like, on, on their mystery remote, they decided to make it look like a telephone dial because they thought people would find more comfort with that. Uh, while we're here, uh, one thing I also I wanted your, your viewers to know is we have a free audio tour of the museum uh, that works on a smartphone. So if you have a smartphone, you can go to our website, which again is www.avlradiomuseum.org, and you'll see instructions for downloading the tour app and then once it's installed you'll get a list of tours in Asheville because there's about a dozen or more and you'll see a tour for the Asheville Radio Museum. So anywhere in the museum where there is a, uh, a number like this one here, uh, that is, is something for which we have information on the, on the smartphone tour. So if you can't come to the museum you can do it from home. Okay, but if they come to the museum they'd actually be having you give the tour? I, yes, we give the tours. I'm one of, of uh, four or five tour guides here at the museum. And so what we like to do when visitors come, and we prefer a small number of visitors, actually no more than eight, is give highly personalized tours so that people can ask questions and we can do our best to answer them. Wolf Walk, how many tours have you conducted? Oh, uh, lost count. <laughs> okay. Do them all the time. Let's look at a few other things, if you can come over here. These, these are ra two radios that people find interesting. This radio here, this radio here, let's change places. This radio here is one that could save lives <clears throat> during World War II. Back during World War II, there were very attractive ladies that were pinup girls. Uh, soldiers would have, have uh, posters of them. And these girls were Gibson girls, is, is the name given to them. So this radio is called a Gibson girl radio because of its shape. That's its nickname. So notice, notice the curves to it. The curves have a purpose. Uh, if you were in a plane or, or a ship and you managed to get into a lifeboat, the lifeboat would have a radio like this. And the reason for the shape is that you would actually be sitting in your life raft and you'd hold it between your knees, or, or legs rather, and then you crank it and as you crank it you're sending out a distress signal that hopefully a, a rescue plane would pick up and, and rescue you before you're found by the enemy. Now does that radio still work or could it work? Uh, probably could. It, it, it actually has in this tube here, you see behind it, 
there is a long wire, which is the antenna, and then there's a balloon, and there's a source of helium there to inflate the balloon. So you use the balloon to pull the antenna wire up in the air, and then you send out your signal. How about these other radios? Do some of them still work, or would they work? We've restored a lot of the radios in the museum. They don't all work, but uh, we'll show you a working radio in just a second. This radio here, this radio could save your life. This radio could get you killed <laughs> if, if you were caught listening to the wrong station. This this radio, let me see, see, I'll show you a picture here. If you were in Germany during World War, World War II, this radio would come with a tag that you see on it. And the tag is in German, but I'll translate for you. It says, think about this. Listening to foreign broadcast is a crime against the national security of our people. It is a fewer order punishable by prison or hard labor. And then later in the war, it was punishable by death if you were caught listening to a foreign station like the BBC or Voice of America. This was uh, this radio. Uh, I think most of us are familiar with the Volkswagen, which is the people's car. So this is the people's radio. It, it was ordered to be produced by the uh, German propaganda minister. I believe it was Hermann Goering, if I remember right. And he wanted an inexpensive radio so that every family could have a radio in their home to listen to Hitler's speeches and his propaganda. And so that was the purpose of, of radio. Do you know, Volkwalk, what the radio cost in terms of today's dollars? Uh, this, this one I don't, but, but it was, I can tell you it was made to be very inexpensive. So it actually used an older technology, which is uh, inexpensive to make. Fascinating. If you can uh, come around this way. This is... Uh, <laughs> I think a rather amazing radio here on the on the floor, or rather on this lower shelf. If you can see it, yeah. this is Asheville's first 1936 police car radio, and it is a beast. <laughs> if you notice on the side, there are uh, flanges where you you would bolt this thing into the trunk of your car. So it, it's hard to imagine being a uh, policeman and not being in radio contact, but in 19, the 1930s, this was a novelty. So so this was in a police car? This was in a police car. And act actually, I know you can't you know, be able to show this in your, your video, but there's an article in, in the 1936 Asheville Citizen Times where the police are talking about how useful radio is. <laughs> this was something new to them. So let's see what else we can see uh, while we're here. Uh, I would like to play this antique phonograph oh, for you while we're here. How old is this phonograph? This is early 1900s. Uh, so this, this is uh, an Edison phonograph from the early days. Instead of playing a flat record, it plays a round record uh, like the one I'm holding in my hand. And this is all mechanical. I, th I think your listeners will be amazed at the sound quality of this machine considering it's 100 years old. And there's no electronic amplification at all. It's, it's just all mechanical. Well, let's see what it sounds like. Quartet. I don't recall okay. the exact name. Nobody famous, but anyway, uh, fun fun machines. And we use these actually to talk about the principle of how sound is is sent on a radio wave. In a record player, you have a basically a groove. This is just a long continuous groove, and in the groove there are bumps, and the bumps represent the sound. So as the needle hits the bumps it causes uh, a diaphragm in here to vibrate and that vibration creates the sound and the sound waves come up through the horn and get amplified. And so with the radio waves, it, it's the bumps on the radio wave, at least in the old uh, amplitude modulated AM radio stations, it's the bumps on the radio wave that create the sound back at the receiver when we receive them. 
Like I said, great quality. It is, it is. It's, it's pretty remarkable. Well, let's, let's see what a 1920s radio might sound like. This is a 1920s radio over here. This, this is uh, around 1926, and this was made actually by RCA, and they called their radio the Radiola. So let's turn it on and see what a 1920s radio might sound like through this 1920s speaker. That's Nashville AM station. And, uh, as of this morning already, they've already found nine dead um, in the storm, and so we definitely need to pray for Nashville and Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and those areas. Now, the sound was current radio? Yes, that's, that's an actual... Exactly, because I was saying they have tornadoes now in Tennessee. So yeah, yeah, that was on the news, uh, on the TV this morning. This is a local Asheville AM radio station. It's normally a religious station, so I was thinking we picked up some gospel music, but apparently they're picking up the news. But again, the sound quality on this was pretty good. This is, uh, this is actual 1920s. This radio is almost 100 years old. I restore these radios as part of my work at the museum, so I just finished restoring this one a couple months ago. And this, this speaker up, up here is, is one I restored cosmetically. Again, it's about 100 years old, uh, but it was working fine. All I did was, was touch up the paint on the cabinet. But po the point being that even in the 1920s, radios sounded pretty good. That must be a fun hobby. That's one of the things you also do in your spare time, restore radios? Uh, my, I don't have formal training in electronics, but I, I'm good enough where I can restore these 1920s radios. And it's a lot of fun bringing these things back to life because I think about the impact that radio had in the 1920s when it came out. It was like the internet of its day. So for example, uh, rural Western North Carolina, you didn't have much in the way of entertainment. I don't know if we had a movie theater here in the 1920s. Uh, you didn't have many, many sources of entertainment, but all of a sudden radio came out and now, now you're getting music and you're getting political speeches and you're getting church services and you're getting all kinds of plays, all kinds of entertainment you wouldn't otherwise get. If people have old radios, do you welcome them or do you want them to ask you about them? Well, we do. Uh, if people, we have a contact form on our website and, and people very often send me an email either asking if they can donate a radio to the museum or they have a radio that has some sentimental value because it was their grandfather's and so I can usually put them in touch with a repair person to try and get it fixed. So we welcome those types of inquiries. So that's, that's a vacuum tube radio, but let's look at what radio looked like before the vacuum tube. Ash Asheville, by the way, got its first radio station in 1927. It's WWNC. They're still broadcasting today. The first radio station that started broadcasting commercially was a station called KDKA in Pennsylvania, and that was in 1920. So it was seven years later that Asheville got its station, and it was funded by the Chamber of Commerce. And I believe the Chamber of Commerce raised what would today be considered a half a million dollars to fund that radio station. And it was uh, installed in the uh, Flatiron Building, actually. The two antennas for the radio station were on top of the Flatiron Building. And so on our website, if anyone's interested, uh, we have uh, a number of old newspaper articles that talk about WWNC when it first started and the entertainers it had and so forth. But anyway, back on crystal radios. These here are vacuum tubes. The vacuum tube that made radios practical was invented by a man named Lee DeForest around 1906. So before vacuum tubes were invented, you had to have what's called a crystal radio. The advantage of the crystal radios is they were very inexpensive and you could build your own basically. So for example here, in the early 1920s, the U.S. government actually published plans where you could ask mom for a, an empty oatmeal box and you could put a coil of wire around it like this and you'd have a headset kind of like this and you'd, you'd put this uh, crystal piece on the top and you could actually make yourself a working radio. And so you'd need no batteries for this and batteries were expensive so poor people could not necessarily afford batteries. And, but you could buy these parts very inexpensively and, and make your own radio. As a kid, did you build the radio? Of course. In fact, uh, I don't know if you can see it in your camera, but in the back here... Just coming over. In the back here is a crystal radio kit. So back in the days when I was a Boy Scout, call it late 50s, early 1960s, 
you could still buy these kits and build your own crystal radios. Do you still have your first radio you built? <laughs> I, I, I don't, but I'll, I'll say this. You're asking me about electronics. There's a museum here uh, in Asheville called the Moog Museum, uh, and Mr. Moog invented a Thurman. And so when I was in junior high school, seventh grade, I actually built a Thurman from scratch using vacuum tubes, and I won first place in the science fair with my Thurman. So. But we don't have it, though. We don't have it, no. This has gone with the wind. Too I'm bad. sure we're having that Thurman. So crystal radios is where things started, and then from that it moved, moved forward into uh, other technology, especially once the vacuum tube was developed. This, this, uh, this thing here is actually a 1930s car radio. Uh, people, of course, started to have automobiles in the, in the teens and the 20s, and when radio became popular in the 20s, they decided they wanted to have them in their car. So there's a big challenge in making them in the car because the ignition system created so much static that they had to find a way to prevent the static. So this big beast would mount up way under your dashboard, and then this would be the controls that you could reach, and it would use these cables. So the cables are like speedometer cables. They're, mechan they're mechanical. One of them is, is for the volume and uh, for tuning the station, and the other one is for the volume. So that's how you got radio in your car. In I imagine, too, they were probably very expensive when they first came out. More than likely. More than likely. This, uh, this here is interesting as well. This is called a verified reception stamp. In the 1920s, you could actually pick up radio stations from all over the country if you had a long antenna outside. And so you could send a little postcard to a radio station like WWNC and say, I heard your station on this date at this time playing this program. And they would send you back a little stamp like uh, the ones you see down at the bottom. So these are the original stamps in the 1920s. This is an enlargement so we can see it better. But this is the stamp for WWNC here in Asheville. And this is the stamp for WWL, which is the station in New Orleans, which is where I'm from uh, before we moved to Asheville after Hurricane Katrina. Great. And in our remaining time, Stuart, so I'll put you on, on against the clock. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to show us in the remaining couple of minutes here? Uh, I think we've covered it pretty well. There, there are so many other things that we could show in the museum, Blaine. But the best way to see them is either for somebody to take the virtual tour on their smartphone, or if they come to the museum, uh, We'd, we'd be more than happy to give them a, a complete tour. Uh, right. There's just too much to talk about in 20 minutes. Okay, and I think also you mentioned to me one last thing we'll point out. Yep. Like I said, that'll be another show we'll do here. But on this whole left side of the, the museum, we didn't talk anything about what's on the right. left side. What's on that side? This, this, is, uh, this is all amateur radio equipment. Amateur radio is, is very interesting. Amateur radio actually got started in the early 1900s when uh, experimenters heard about what Marconi was doing, and they decided that they would try to build their own radios. So the early radios here are examples of some home-built radios that people, uh, people built. Interestingly in enough, even before World War I, there were, there were several thousand amateur radio operators in the United States. So when World War I started, the U.S. government uh, decided to use radio as part of their military operations, but they had no trained radio operators. So they put out the call to amateur radio operators saying, would you please volunteer and accelerate our efforts to use radio in World War I? And, and several thousand radio amateurs signed up for that. And so don't realize it, that people still are into amateur radio. You know, as we were talking before the show a little bit about Smokey and the Bandit and, and that whole range of popularity. So people still do it, is that correct? They, they, they do. Citizens uh, uh, Band Radio was a kind of a phase that has mostly died by now. I think truckers still use it. But amateur radio is still very popular. Uh, I think the numbers are that there are 800,000 amateur radio operators around the, the world. I think that's correct. There are 20,000 of them that are licensed just in North Carolina alone. It's a very active hobby, and the amateur radio operators still do a lot of work during emergencies. So for example, during Hurricane Katrina, when all of the, uh, the telephone communications were down, the even cell phone towers were down, the amateur radio operators were able to provide emergency communications in and out of New Orleans. And just as a reminder, if folks want to come to the museum, yes. best bet to get information is what? The, the hours we're open are from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock on Saturdays. Uh, we're normally closed during December and January. But at any time of the year, if somebody has visitors coming into town or something where they can't get to us during our normal hours, 
they can use the contact form on our website and we'll try and arrange to, to have them come over at some other time. And again, our website address is www.av, like Victor, A-V-L, Radio Museum, all one word, dot org. Uh, thank you very much, Stuart Salkin, for being my guest this, um, this uh, special Blaine Tour show on the, world, uh, on the road. We hope to see you at a regular time on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. on WPVM. Speak to you soon.